Um, thanks for joining us on the program, Alexander. I really appreciate it. So, um, you know, I, you recently reported that lawmakers in the capital of capital, our very own New York City, are considering a resolution that targets banks, asset managers, and insurers to stop fossil fuel financing and divest from oil, uh, oil gas, and coal. Can you talk about what that could mean uh, uh, in the fight for climate justice? Certainly, and, and actually, there, there's some, there's some new updates to this to report. Ooh. So since this, uh, the, so first of all, this was a resolution that was introduced uh, in the uh, uh, city council on Monday. Uh, it was led by Brad. They're still Lander. meeting with city council. <laughs> they are meeting over Zoom. They've been figuring this out, but um, they. Uh, uh, Brad Lander, who's a progressive city councilor from Park Slope in Brooklyn. He's my guy. He's also now running for comptroller of the city uh, in next year's election. And, uh, you know, a, a favored candidate among, I, I think, the, the left in, in New York. Uh, he put out this resolution that was, you know, it's just a resolution. It doesn't really have teeth to it, but it is essentially staking a claim in the fact that the city... Uh, wants to demand that a lot of these big financiers and insurers and asset managers drop fossil fuels. Uh, and this is coming right at a moment when big banks, including JP Morgan, are about to actually seize control of a lot of oil producers and frackers in the U.S. because they are suffering so much as a result of the uh, drop in oil and they are so deeply in debt. And so what has happened since then- Can you talk about what does it mean if a bank seizes an oil company and why is that okay with people as opposed to if a government seizes an oil company? Well, uh, the, the one, one uh, you know, the nationalization is another debate that's happening right now and, and a real one. I, in fact, published a story on that this morning, but it- Ah, I didn't get it in time. But <laughs> it is, uh, we can talk about that after this, but, but it's, you know, I, I mean, that is obviously a much more involved process, whereas, you know, these companies, uh, the, these fracking companies and drilling companies in general are, for the most part, deeply, deeply, deeply in debt. So it's not really a choice. I mean, they're not able to pay their loans back. And, and in these cases, uh, as Reuters reported last week, the, you know, uh, a lot of the big banks are looking to actually take control of these and, and make sure that they aren't losing even more money on them by, by, you know, exercising direct control over their operations. What so, does this mean for production? Do you believe, I mean, if the bank, own, let me just see if I get this straight from a completely, I just coming new to this. If the bank owns the, the production of oil and gas, they're going to be, you know, a bottom line arguer like this, yeah, you know, uh, taking gas out of the ground is not cost effective, especially now because we can't sell it because everyone's stuck in their house for, you know, could be a month, could be three years. We don't really know what we're looking at here. Um, do you think this would be a boon for, say, a cleaner energy environment? It's, that's really difficult to say. Uh, you know, I mean, at this point, it's not, you know, I mean, this is, these are not, uh, uh, you know, the, these banks are not exactly seizing these companies with the intention of shutting them down. They're seizing them with the intention of losing less money on them. And so, you know, the, the idea that, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a bank is designed to extract as much wealth as it possibly can and, and profit as it possibly can from its holdings. And, you know, it's not a, you know, demand for oil while it is at a rock bottom level right now you know, is not going to go away permanently. At a, at a certain point, the economy is going to open back up again. And if you look right now, you know, the, the precipitous drop in oil prices that led, you know, the price per barrel on futures contracts to dip into the negative range for the first time this week, you know, that that is for next month's contracts. You know, and if you look at what oil delivery contracts for the month of June are trading at, it's extremely low, but it's not a negative number. So, you know, the, the, it, it's important to recognize that this is not, um, you know, the, this event alone is not, you know, the, the uh, pure death knell for the industry. Uh, and there are a lot of other steps that will have to come to that, that point before this. So I think to read into the idea that, that you know, banks taking it over uh, means that they're going to wind down production, I think, is, is not accurate. Uh, but it but it is a sign of of the health of this industry, and it is a sign that this new campaign that launched late last year, targeting financiers of of fossil fuels and not just fossil fuel companies themselves, 
is a you know a, is a, is a smart uh, strategy because obviously these are going to be the the institutions that that you're going to have to convince uh, if you are really going to alienate this this uh, the the fossil fuel industry from the the you know the polite society part of the economy, um, but I but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect that to be. Uh, if the bill put, introduced this week in the city council doesn't actually force the banks to do anything, mm -hmm. and it's symbolic, then how does it carry weight? Well, so so uh, you're actually seeing this carry weight in in what uh, has happened afterward, which is that yesterday the sitting comptroller uh, Scott Stringer. Uh, who is running for mayor next year? Oh, uh, he is. Yes, and Brad that. Lander is looking to you know fill his seat as comptroller. And my uh, friend Justin Krebs is running for Brad Lander's seat, so it's all in the family. Interesting. Interesting. We should talk about that. <laughs> I'm, I'd, I'd like to hear more about that. But but uh, you know the the um, uh, you know the a resolution came out from the for our. our um, uh, an, an official statement came out of the comptroller's office yesterday that said that you know it it was go the city was going to formally uh, vote against the reelect as a shareholder in J.P. Morgan was going to vote against the reelection of Lee Raymond to the mm -hmm. board of directors of J.P. Morgan. Now you know uh, that's how it works with a public company that that big shareholders get a significant vote in in board seats, and 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 that's how that that will normally play out. And so the city said, you know, we are going to vote against Lee Raymond. Lee Raymond is the former CEO of Exxon Mobil mm -hmm. and was responsible for overseeing and and rubber stamping the you know the really the worst of the climate denial campaign that ExxonMobil funded. In fact, it was after Lee Raymond left office that they started to step away from some of the more belligerent actors in the climate denial space. So this guy is really uniquely responsible for propagating the misinformation network that we are still grappling with today and that we are actually seeing, you know, uh, encourage some of these anti-COVID lockdown protests and in some states, so it's a really toxic uh, uh, legacy that that he left behind. And the city of New York said, you know, we are going to oppose this and and try to rally others to do it. Since then, I saw that the state of New York has joined that call, as well as uh, uh, the, the the state of Pennsylvania. So that I I this number I, I'd have to double check, but but uh, the number that I saw is that that is a combined eight to nine million shares that they. Control, which is a pretty sizable and 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 significant uh, rebellion of of shareholders at this upcoming meeting. So that's pretty significant, and and I would say that that is linked back to what this broader resolution is calling for. Uh, you know, and so while it's symbolic, its passage would really you know add more fuel to this movement and would likely spur a lot of other legislative efforts that would be more specific and have teeth, but could point back to this resolution to say, look, you know, majority of the city council and the mayor approved of this resolution that we were going to pass. And, and we agree that the, the, the principles of the lawmakers of New York is that, you know, the, the finance industry has got to go. And that could open the door to some really interesting policy ideas that I think progressives would like to see the city adopt. Things like what? Well, uh, you know, on the on the more moderate end, uh, you could see the city push to remove some of its very lucrative accounts from some of these big banks, like a J.P. Morgan, which does a lot of the banking services for the city, uh, to something like Amalgamated Bank, which is you know based in the city and which uh, you know has a long history of supporting cooperatives and and nonprofits and and has a 100% fossil fuel free portfolio that you can invest in so that that that's one pathway uh, well, i'm going to go um, do that right now um, in fact a more <laughs> Can we do that online? I can't go outside. Right, I know, I know. The Chase banking is very convenient on the app, but but uh, but the, the uh, that's how you know, they get you. <laughs> you know that and the ATMs everywhere. Uh, but the, the 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 flip of that too, or or not the flip, but but the more uh, ambitious goal 
uh, for activists there would actually be for the city to form a public bank of its own that would be a, a municipally run uh, you know a, a lending entity uh, it, you know this this is obviously a bit more complicated the state would have to approve of it it would you know require a lot of money at a point that you know we're looking at a, at a a big budget gap for the city coming up because of the COVID response. So, you know, there's going to be belt tightening, really not, not investment in, in, in capital intensive projects like this, but, but the, you know, a, a public bank ostensibly uh, would be, you know, a, a municipally controlled uh, financial entity that would, you know, not only, you know, manage the city's money for the city and, and, and not for, you know, the, the profit of a larger institution, but would be willing to take higher, risk projects uh in poorer neighborhoods you know one of the bigger problems is that you know as the as rooftop solar has proliferated as you know energy efficiency which is really probably the most important thing that the city can be doing to reduce its emissions and reduce its energy footprint uh you know as as those types of retrofits are are in demand you know it's who do you think can afford to do them and who do you think that that a bank wants to lend money to for uh to support a project like that it's typically not uh, you know, the people who are living in neighborhoods like East New York or, you know, uh, in, in the Rockaways and are, you know, the, the, there's not going to automatically be that return on investment. And even when there is, you know, in many cases, we've seen where there are these investments in the city and then, and then that money, uh, you know, is, you know, in order to turn a profit, they end up displacing a lot of the residents in those actual neighborhoods. And so, in theory, you know, I mean, we haven't really seen this in practice in a place like New York, uh, but but in theory, a public bank would be able to, you know, make some more humane investments on that front and would be able to, uh, you know, really support uh, the kind of rapid deployment of the things that we need to decarbonize uh, at, at the rate at a rate that the city would be amenable to. Do you think uh, the moves like this being made by climate activists and progressives, you know, while the city and nation are fighting a pandemic go hand in hand, or do you think it will be too much of a challenge to tackle both of these things at once? It's a good question. Uh, you know, I mean, the, I, the, there are a few factors in this, you know, I mean, on the, the, the cynical side, uh, you know, the city is, Again, facing the, this budget gap, and and you know, is in the midst of this really, uh, you know, this really horrifying and traumatic and deadly event. You know, I mean, we've lost more of our neighbors than we did in 9/11, and and that's going to be something that will will stick with us for a long time, and I'm sure will continue to animate our politics long after we are, you know, out out of our quarantines. But and I think people are going to leave the city. I mean, according that to that true. New York Times uh, article, yeah. the city, what you love about the city is not coming back for a while because we won't be able to get together. So how yeah. are we going to go to Broadway and all of those things that, that, you know, you put up with a tiny place to live so that you can have access to these other things. And if those don't come back, people with means will leave and then we'll be back to the 70s. But on the plus side, housing prices might drop <laughs> <laughs> for those of well. us who are still stuck here. So you know it's 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 difficult to predict those things, right? But the the, the more optimistic uh, perspective may be that over the past couple of years, the city has really aggressively um, you know uh, uh, moved in in the right direction when it came to climate things. You know, it started in 2018 with the mayor announcing that the city was going to sue big oil companies for climate damages. Uh, and join that movement, and then they you know, they began the the Byzantine process of divesting the city's five billion dollars and uh, of its pension funds from fossil fuels, uh, and then now it's moving in this direction. And, and and sorry, actually, last summer, probably the most important thing, they they passed a huge bill uh, that required landlords of big buildings to uh, do extensive retrofits to really dramatically reduce their energy usage. Uh, and, you know, energy usage in big buildings is the biggest source of, of energy usage in, in, in the city. So that's a pretty big deal. I mean, you're also seeing things, you know, that one of the biggest sources of emissions and pollution is cars. And, you know, you're seeing things like, uh, you know, 14th Street shut down. You're seeing a bill coming out of the city council right now to to open more streets to pedestrians and close them off to cars. Uh, and so I think a lot of climate people would say that those are steps in the right direction. And you can imagine that next year being this huge, huge election where there will be a new mayor, where there will be a majority of new, you know, the majority of the city council will be new first time freshman faces. 
Uh, and so that is, I mean, that, that's a huge deal. And, and you can expect that, you know, this being a, a major concern for New Yorkers and not just because, you know, environmentalism is a pet project of liberals here. You know, it's people here remember it's Hurricane Sandy. You know, people here uh, lived through that or lost loved ones in that or lost property in that. And, and those are working class New Yorkers. And so I don't think that climate change is an abstract idea to, to New York voters. And I would expect that, you know, this is going to be a major theme of next year's election, both for the comptroller, certainly that's what Brad Lander is signaling here, uh, but also for the mayor. You know, Corey Johnson is, is another leading uh, candidate, the, the speaker of the, the city council. He has really been pushing climate stuff and, and was a major force behind these bills that that were were pushed through the city council. Scott Stringer also, you know, he's made the he's made the divestment campaign a big a big deal and and has talked a good game on climate. So, you know, you can expect that at least in the competition between the two of them for the progressive vote in the city, that uh, there may be a little arms race on climate, which would be a good thing overall. So I, I would expect that this is going to continue. Well, Alexander, you you made mention that you uh, uh, have a new piece coming about out of today about nationalizing the fossil right. fuel industry. Can you talk a little bit about what that might look like? Sure, it's up. It's up now um, on HuffPost.com. Uh, but it's it's a uh, uh, who is talking about this? People outside of 350.org, or who you know? Are, are, do we have electeds talking about this? It's definitely primarily right now the the you know the the climate left activists. I mean, you have Sunrise Movement talking about it. You have the DSA talking about it. Food and Water Watch, which is definitely a leftier, but but pretty. Uh, you know, ballsy. Uh, uh, I've been talking group. about this for years, by the way. People called me crazy on HuffPost Live. They called me crazy. Really? So, yeah. Like, you know, well, I mean, they didn't say you're crazy. They did that thing that they do when you're on TV and they don't agree with you. They'll be like, "What do you think, Jim?" And you know, like their face drops and they move away. <laughs> that happened I mean, a lot. Well, like when I was supporting Bernie Sanders, you know. But that was a whole. That was another. Whole Look, time. you know the uh, po post post Cold War Fukuyama end of history brain is a is a real thing that people yeah. are still overcoming, you know, and, and coming to grips with the fact that that analysis was turns out completely wrong. Um, so it uh, you know the, it's a challenge for people to come around to things, and certainly you know oil nationalization carries the connotation of you know, tin pot That's dictators really like a Colonel Gaddafi coming in and, and, you know, taking over the oil industry so that he can exploit it and pillage the resources to support his own regime. That is certainly, uh, you know, there, there's certainly historical examples of that, but there are also many other historical examples of nationalization that were peaceful and, and, and actually quite effective for the governments that, that took them over. You know, Saudi Arabia did it uh, in the seventies when many countries did it. Uh, you know, the uh, Norway did it also in the 70s with the company that we now know as Equinor, which in fact is building some of the offshore wind turbines off Long Island now. Um, and, and I'm not you know, sure I would, was that a good idea if Trump is still, or Trump's prodigies are still in the White House? To call for nationalization? Yeah, because then they're going to be in charge of what? Well, that, that's a really <laughs> good bad. That's a really good question. I mean that, so, you know, I, I tried, so that anyway, the, the, the piece as it, as it illustrates is just talking about the reemergence of, of these calls saying that, look, with oil uh, at this you know, rock bottom price right now, you know, that the industry is weaker than it, than it has been in, in, you know, recent memory. And this would be the right time to take it over with the explicit goal of winding it down and shutting it down. And, and, advocates of this point to the fact that, you know, just this week, there were layoffs of 6,000 workers in a single day in Texas, you know, so this is not just about, you know, uh, uh, punishing the fossil fuel industry or, or, you know, removing the obstacle that the oil industry poses to political change on climate, but is also about actually just protecting these workers and that this transition is going to happen either way. So do we want to do it in a way that helps people and, and keeps people safe and, and, and you know, gainfully uh, employed? Or do we want to do it in, in a chaotic, uh, you know, unplanned way, which is what appears to be happening already? So, you know, I think that's a powerful argument. I think it's, I think it's one worth considering. I do think, though, that it is worth really looking hard at what the 
realities of doing something like this would be and what some of the drawbacks would be, you know? And, and I think that those are real too. And I think it's important that people on the left really consider those things before going gung ho in any direction on something like this. And, you know, some of those challenges include, you know, first of all, the, the legal challenges to executing on this, you know, so assume that you have the, you have the votes, you have the, the you know, the, the political will to do something like this, which does not exist presently. Uh, you know, you would then come up against the, the the legal challenges to it, which would be immense. I mean, you know, the the fossil fuel industry managed to uh, marshal the resources of you know half the states, uh, the states attorneys general in the U.S. to oppose things as moderate as you know the pretty modest regulations that came out of the Obama administration on climate, and they were successful, especially with the makeup of the Supreme Court even then. Now consider it now, you know, with with two appointees from Trump. So that that's a big problem. The second Alex, thing is that no. you have. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no. I was, you you know you you have a, a the, the the property rights regime in in the United States is such that you know people who own the surface also own the minerals underneath, and so you have a lot of individuals who actually make money leasing their property to drilling companies, and so you'd have to deal with lawsuits from them as well. And even if you could finally execute on it and get that state-run oil company, there's a really high potential for corruption and other problems, and the agencies that we would expect to regulate against that have been significantly weakened under Trump. So those are things that you'd have to really, really consider if this is like an idea that you really are hoping will happen. The Green New Deal doesn't mention anything about nationalizing, uh, you know, oil production. And I think, I'm not sure how it would fit in with actually diminishing production and switching to a green economy. You know, even even the you know, I, I think with anything like this, there will be a piecemeal approach, and there will be multiple fronts that you're fighting on uh, in order to you know achieve the ultimate goal of of you know uh, not everybody control. dying, <laughs> right? Uh, but but even with nationalization, you know, there are multiple strategies that you probably have to take just to make that one piece of the of the puzzle work. You know, there, there's a great report that came out this month that illustrates actually five different policy pathways that you could take. Uh, and, you know, they are, you know, uh, there, there are varying degrees of possibility with them, but, but you know, even, even there, you know, you, you'd probably have to do multiple things just to cobble together all the different pieces of, of the oil industry. You know, it's not like the oil industry isn't just Chevron and Exxon. You know, it's a lot of smaller companies. It's a lot of you know, family owned businesses too, that you'd have to, you'd have to reckon with, you know, and you'd have to make sure that you were paying those people a fair compensation, you know, that that's, that's somebody's whole wealth and retirement and plan to feed their family. You got to make sure that they, you know, they get a, a fair break. You know, they weren't the ones funding climate denialism. They were just participating in an industry that while toxic, uh, you know, paid the bills. Could, could make the money. Yeah. Well, I, there's some complicity in that too. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a nice, uh, strong social safety net could be helpful in, in, an, in a time like that to make it not so difficult for people to give up, you know, blood money, I would say. Uh, coming in from Memo, I said that, not you, Alexander. Um, coming from Memo for the record in our stream chat is a, is a comment. The military primarily uses oil until they have a solution to, until they have a solution to this issue. Oil will never go away. Thoughts? You know, I think that's a, I think that's a wise point. I mean, you know, I think uh, Elizabeth Warren put out a plan last year that was meant to decarbonize most of the military by 2030. And yeah, you know, there were a lot of people on the left who really criticized her and said, "Oh, you know, you're focusing on decarbonizing the military. You're a warmonger, and you know, the only good climate policy is one that dismantles the you know American imperial uh, military industrial complex." And you know, I'm not. I'm, that may not be wrong, you know, that may be a, a, a worthy goal as well, but, but that is, uh, She's you like, know, you're never happy, you people. <laughs> well, if you're going to, if you're going to wait around for, you know, the dismantling of the American empire, uh, you know, to decarbonize, then, you know, we are probably not going to achieve, uh, you know, the, the cuts that we need to in the very short period of time that we need to achieve them to save many, 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 many lives. So, you know, so I, Trump's I, doing kind of a good job. 
or the coronavirus uh, is doing kind of a good job of dismantling <laughs> some of uh, America's empire here. Uh, you uh, know, it's it's certainly not it's, on it's purpose. He's doing. Uh, that. You know, it's certainly throwing things into stark contrast and helping people to understand them. So that that is useful. Um, but you know the uh, you know the the. The, the, the military will, will certainly have to play a significant role in that. And you can imagine that, you know, under a different kind of administration, that the direction to the Department of Defense to research and, and carry out these things uh, would be quite useful in, in uh, you know, ultimately achieving a, a Green New Deal of some kind. Uh, Alexander, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Alexander Kaufman, climate reporter. You can follow him on Twitter at Alex C. Kaufman, K-A-U-F-M-A-N. We will see you in two weeks, and I look forward to reading your piece. Uh, you can read Alexander's work at HuffPost. Thanks again for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Stay safe. Yeah, you too. It's always nice to see you pop up here. It's like, oh, he's still... He's still good. That's good. I'll have different facial hair by, by two weeks from now, so don't worry. I love it. I love all the good <laughs> I hopefully will not. Uh, <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel here, please. We come out with at least 10 good interviews, plus more content every week uh, with people who are making the news, who are knowledgeable in the progressive sphere. So thanks again. And, um, and thanks, Alexander. I'll say bye to you at this point. If I hang up on you, Alexander, you can never come back into this. So you have to hang up on me. <laughs> oh, you're gone. That's perfect.